We had like a kind of a weird winter, um, where it's like several, like towards the tail end of winter, it would get like 60, 65 degrees for about a week, yep. and then it would drop down and it would get to, you know, 20 or, or, you know, colder even, overnight it seemed. And I think that really did a, a number on like bud mortality, where it was killing, because there was water circulating in the vine, and then it would freeze. We knew early this spring that we were having bud mortality issues and um, which is you know not out of the ordinary and then now just last week or this weekend we had two days I'm gonna park over at the schoolhouse yeah that's fine we had two days that were um, between 27 and 30 degrees but we also had a heavy frost and that vineyard right there was bright green on Friday and I'll show you it's just not anymore. This is not our first year um, with frost issues too. Last year we actually had a record year yeah. um, with our harvest. So um, we're kind of used to the ups and downs. So it's not all bad. <laughs> we do right. have good years. Yes, yeah, true. So you can see what it's supposed to look like, what the shoots are supposed to look like. Right here, nice and green and pretty. And then obviously these are the ones that got hit by frost and, and more than likely these will not recover. You know, the cluster there, that's what it would have been the fruit. Um, the only thing we can hope for now is that inside each bud there's, a, there's more than one um, bud. They call it primary, secondary, and tertiary. Yeah. Um, we just have to hope that the secondary buds come out and that they're fruitful. And it just poses some challenges as far as like fruit quality. Um, and then age difference too. So you see we got like, these shoots are obviously gonna be older than anything else that comes out. So then you have to deal with, like you were saying, we have some fruit that's, that's ripe and ready to go. And then we have a lot of fruit that's not. And what do you do and how do you manage that. Yeah, right now, I mean, right now, it, everything would be glowing green if we hadn't had the frost that we had. Um, you can see that they just wilted. I mean, they're done. Yeah. Um, hopefully they, they do in, in the next couple of weeks, by like May 15th, we'll see kind of the new growth that's going to come and what we'll, what we'll have. But right now it's just a waiting game. It's hard to predict uh, what kind of yield we're going to have. Yeah. We're gonna do a quick jump in time just for a few minutes, just to show you how much the vines have recovered. Things are looking pretty good. We'll see what it does as the fruit begins to mature and everything, but the vines definitely look a lot better now. Um, so what, what varietal is this? Is this is Rougeon. So this is a, it's a, it's a French American hybrid, super vigorous. This of all the varieties that we have can handle it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a super common variety around here. It's kind of, um, it's a high producer for us. Um, I think Andrew says that a lot of it goes into the velvet red. Mm -hmm. I'm not super sure. We use it a lot in our blended wines. Yeah. Um, cause it is a good grower, a good producer. So we always have a lot, a lot of, of it. it and it tastes good. <laughs> That's the most Rougeon. important part. <laughs> I love Rougeon. It's, it's easy for us to grow. Yeah. That's why I like it. It can handle a lot of this mm -hmm. wishy-washy weather, and it's going to bounce back probably better than most varieties that we have. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's the thing with plants. Like, you never know how much it can make up after yeah. it's had a real right. big, horrible stressor. And we, mm -hmm. what can it do coming out of it? And every year it's going to be a little bit different. So last year was like a banner year. Mm -hmm. Which also could have Did played a... Did it recover a, a lot mm -hmm. this winter or not? So it could have, the, the, the bumper crop that we had last year could play a part in the, the excessive winter damage that we've seen this year, mm -hmm. you know, where you stress your vines all, all summer long last year, you know, but of course you don't, you want the fruit. So you push your vines and you make them work hard and then, then you have a bad winter where you're, you're, you know, you're in and out of dormancy and then you have a, a late frost in the spring and, and so that bucket of stressors is just getting more and more full. Yeah. Um, vines like Rougeon are more capable of handling it than some of our other varieties. I don't know. We do, when we think about what varietals to grow, 
we have always had an extensive like R and D research and development vineyard. So we try out yeah. new varietals and see how they do with years like this. So it's the stability over different kinds of environments. That right. You're probably and looking at vines that have a later bud break, mm -hmm. so that hopefully the frost, yep. uh, it misses the frost and then brings out the buds afterwards. Um, so it's kind of it's always a balancing act. I think being a farmer, um, you know, you do what you can to mitigate any kind of natural disaster and stuff. But at the end of the day, like you are at risk. Mother Nature gives us what we what she gives us, and we just do our best. Um, when we do have frosts like this, there are things that we do to mitigate losses. So Sam will pick specific vineyards that are in dips or at more risk, mm -hmm. and they'll burn hay bales and try to keep it warm. One year we brought in a helicopter um, to push warm air mm -hmm. down um, to kind of keep the vines warm as well. So it's all a balancing act. <laughs> How many different varietals do you grow? Uh, we have 12 varieties in full production yeah. um, with another yeah, half dozen or so in R&D. Um, we just planted at seven acres of uh, vinifera, which is new for us. So it's Cab Franc, uh, Dornfelder, Oxioar. Um, those are relatively new for us. Having a little bit of an issue with them this year, but so is everything else. Yeah. Um, so I don't anticipate that being a big problem. Um, I think they handled it pretty well because the bud break was a little bit later. They, they just, everything's having a hard year. Yeah, so it takes three years for a vine to even start producing fruit. And it's, you know, everyone talks about like, oh, these are 100-year-old vines. As the vines get older, they produce less, but it's better quality. So, yeah, so a young vine will throw out a bunch of fruit, but it might not be the highest quality fruit. Um, so that's why people keep like old vines in the ground. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's definitely um, a, a forward investing spotted. situation. You know, you don't plant something and have it produced that year. You gotta plan, you know, three to five years out. Yeah, it's a it's a I'm long it's it. a long term crop, you know, which can be beneficial. But it's like it's constantly something happening, right? Yeah. Constantly. Okay. Oh, a little bit about the schoolhouse over here. So this area was actually settled by Italian immigrants. Yeah. And so the Italian immigrants in the area all brought winemaking with them and grape growing. So they planted typically Concord grapes. Um, so they needed somewhere for their children to go to school. So they built this one room schoolhouse in the 1800s and they all paid, I think it was like $2 each <laughs> for like a group fund for their children to go to school. Get it all started up. Yeah. And so it actually worked out that during Prohibition, since they grew Concord grapes, <laughs> Welch's came in and made them part of the co-op. So this area became part of Welch's. Really? And so they grew the Concord grapes for both world wars to make, you know, jams and juice and all of that. I had no idea. So it protected the area during Prohibition when they couldn't make wine or, you know, had to make it in their bathtub or <laughs> yeah. in the secret part of the garage. Yeah. So. Right, but in areas like Herman, you know, they ripped vines out, yeah. they put uh, winemaking equipment down wells, they destroyed it. They turned um, the cellars into mushroom houses. Yeah, so they didn't quite make it out as well as this area did. Like, there were still vineyards here Welch. afterwards. Yep, because of Welch's. That is cool. Yeah, there's a lot of cool history here. Thanks for checking out our videos. We'd love for you to subscribe, watch some more videos, follow our podcast in general. I'm your host, Janice Ferson.